call this meeting or re call this meeting out of recess. We have uh, two cases to go tonight. Um, we have the uh, Wilner appeal and the Jacobs appeals. Um, and I've been told that in both cases the taxpayers do not expect to be here. So we're ready to go. Um, do you want to start with Wilner and Rosie, do you want to? Um, so, um, this was a, a house on Terrace Street that had sold recently. Um, um, and the appellant was making a couple of different arguments. And so one argument that they were making was that, um, uh, houses that have sold recently are being unfairly penalized compared to other houses um, because the sale vet, the sale price is being taken into account, which makes it inequitable um, when you look at how much the price, the valuation has increased since last time around. And we decided to not look at that argument um, about comparing the percentage increase from last time around because um, we didn't feel that we should look at whether the last time's valuations were fair. So we, we didn't look at that, but what we did look at um, was their argument around condition. Um, the assessment um, had uh, indicated that this property was in um, very good condition, um, and um, the appellant was arguing that even new houses don't necessarily have that rating for condition, um, and they pointed out a number of things about their property that made it... Uh, not, not in good condition. Um, and then they were also arguing, uh, making an equity argument uh, because there were a number of other properties um, in their neighborhood that they felt were very similar and were um, assessed lower. So uh, we did the site visit and we did note that there were a number of cosmetic flaws around the property. Um, structurally, everything seemed fine, um, but there were, um, an, in, listed in the report a number of cosmetic things that we noted that probably didn't align with a, a very good um, and uh, so we decided to discount it from very good to good very good which is the next tick down um, and that brought the valuation if we did that um, down to 40 sorry um, yeah, exactly. 410900. <laughs> um, and um, so we looked at that and then we compared that on a per square foot basis to two other properties, which actually both the assessor and the appellant had pulled um, as comparables. So we, we focused on those two um, and felt that the condition of this property was still higher than those other two properties. So taking all that into consideration, um, we felt good lowering the valuation slightly based on condition. And then when compared to the other properties, that that was an equity. Uh, Anybody have any questions? Tim. Yeah, so was one of the two properties the house next door? Um, I think that the house next door was um, included on one of the lists, but that is not. Oh, no, um, 60 Terrace, yes. So they really, okay, because it did seem like a big difference because they're kind of twinsy houses. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we didn't, we didn't go into the house next, we didn't do a site visit of any of the comparables. We just looked at the property cards. So we took the property card conditions of the other properties at, at face value. Um, but yeah, that one and then uh, one just down the street at 41 Terrace, which was pretty similar as well. So, um wasn't a basement under the garage, but there was a basement that was finished. That's finished under um, the main. Yeah. Okay. And it was pretty recently finished, I think. Yeah, and it, we thought that that's where the condition came from because the parts that had recent, the basement and then the bathroom that had recently been redone were basically in like new condition, but the rest of it wasn't. Anything else? Okay. Sorry, I, can't, I was just going to say I can't. I wasn't here to hear the evidence. Oh, we'll check that. Thank you. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. Well, I think 
everybody else was here from Jacobs. No, I was Sarah wasn't. Okay. I mean, neither you. Oh, I was here from Jacobs. Yeah. Okay. No, I got you. Okay. Well, that looks. That's. Let me just make sure that's consistent. Oh, and just while you're doing that, uh, the members of the uh, board who are here remotely, is it just. yourselves for the record. So, Jude and Donna, would you please introduce yourselves? Is it possible to go down the line? Okay. I'll just, just try to crank it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, is that better? Um, yeah, that's good. What would you like me to do? I'm, I'm not sure I heard you. Just, just introduce yourself because when we have people at a public body, Members of the public body who are t participating remotely, that's one of the rules. So just say who you are. Jack, you need to move your papers away from the speaker. You're probably at the phone. Yeah. Sorry. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, Jude and Donna, would you please state your names? Uh, Jude Newman. Donna Bay. Great, thank you. Now, should Rosie go over the report again? No, I could hear Rosie, but I couldn't hear anyone else. Weird. Okay. Well, well, good. She's the person you needed to hear for this part of it. So the chair would entertain a motion to uh, uh, support the committee's report. Any, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted that report. And I don't have it in front of me now because I scrolled. Who did not vote on that one? Mary. Yes, you are here. Great. Okay. So that's done, and we can move on to the Jacobs properties, and I'll present that because I wrote the uh, report. And uh, Donna and Jude, can you hear me? Okay. Good. <clears throat> this was the appeal that you all may remember from early in the process, and it is a lot of different properties. And for the record, I think I'll, I'll list all the properties that we're uh, taking up. Uh, over, owned by Overlake Park, LLC, we have 5 to 7 State Street, 15 Barry Street, 28 Main Street, 41 to 45 State Street, 49 Greenwood Terrace, 54 Main Street, 58 State Street, 83 East State Street, 96 to 98 Barry Street, 104 Barry Street, and 139 Main Street. 
for Jailhouse Common Associates 2, we have 2 to 4 Spring Street. For Ajax Moving and Storage LLC, we have 44 to 50 Main Street. For Big Fish LLC, we have 70 Main Street. For Interstate Enterprises LLC, we have 4 Langdon Street. For James Olson Holdings LLC, we have 2 to 4 Monsignor Crosby Avenue and 99 to 101 East State Street. And for City Line Realty LLC, we have 100 to 110 Main Street. And, uh, and the issue in all of these uh, cases was the same, which was that the, uh, the assessor, uh, you remember the assessor last year as part of the process sent a survey out to all the commercial property owners in the city to find out to get their income and expenses for their properties. And a large percentage, 65% or something like that of the uh, of the people who got the survey responded. Based on that information, the uh, assessor constructed a formula uh, or of income and expenses to be imputed to all of the uh, commercial property owners. And the uh, complaint that the property owners in, the, in these cases were was making were making was that the um, the assessor should have used their actual income and expenses rather than the uh, standard set of figures for income and expenses that uh, that the assessor was using. And uh, and the report suggests that that this is that the assessor was right that the taxpayer was not correct because for a couple of reasons. One, if we allow the uh, <clears throat> if we allow one property owner or one set of property owners to proceed based on their actual income and expenses, then in fairness, all the other property owners in the city should be able to have uh, their taxes, their assessment computed in that way for the income uh, method. Um, second, it uh, doing it the way the uh, property owner is requesting has the possibility of putting distortions into the uh, into the process because if you have someone, if a landlord who's particularly bad at running their property, then <coughs> they could get a lower assessment because their incomes might be might be too low or their expenses might be too high, and so they would be getting rewarded for being uh, being not good at what they do and a particularly efficient landlord would actually get uh, penalized by uh, by being able to manage their properties at a better ratio of income to expenses. And I remember with uh, one of the property owners that uh, where the appeal was, uh, was withdrawn, uh, a big part of the, uh, of the argument was, well, look, my, uh, Properties run down. We haven't done any. Nothing's been done to the property in 20 years. The, the whole the building is almost completely vacant. So I deserve a break for that. And uh, <coughs> that doesn't seem like a a sensible way to do it. Um, <coughs> beyond that, uh, the the comparable sales and the uh, and the equity uh, comparables also really support the. Uh, the values that the uh, the assessor came up with. So for those reasons, we concluded that uh, we should support the uh, the assessor's uh, judgment in all of these properties. Just for the record, the uh, Olson and City Line Realty Holdings were the ones that they withdrew at the meeting and didn't have an issue. Okay. So. Okay, Sal. So. It's list. It's on the yeah on the final report that I generate. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, th I think it was set out before I did a little bit of editing, including yeah, I, I figured it was putting all those lists. Yep. Sure mm -hmm. too. Rosie. Um, so I noticed in the report you mentioned that the equity and sales data maybe even indicated that these were underassessed, and I wondered if the committee considered increasing the assessments because of that. 
we didn't, and we simply didn't talk about it. But again, I think that since we're mainly going by income method for the uh, commercial properties, I think it's reasonable to accept the assessor's judgment that the income method is what gets us to these uh, property values. I, I thought your rationale for for maintaining the income method and um, not not rewarding inefficient property owners made sense. It made me think in this particular case that this property owner has many properties and based on their arguments that many of the, the, the buildings were unrented or only partially rented, that feels like inefficient operation. And because of the large number of properties they own, I wonder if actually they're bringing down um, that uh, formula for everybody um, and that whether sales data should be taken more into consideration um, because of that oh, situation a, in Montpelier. Um. Yeah, that's, that's a real interesting point. Actually, we've, uh, I've had uh, conversations with uh, at least one council member who thought, well, you know, we should do something about landlords who keep their properties vacant. Why should they? We we should. There should be some incentive that the city creates to get property into productive use. Well, and it, it's sort of a weird situation. I mean, aside from the negative impacts on the city itself of having all these vacant properties, it does sort of seem like it could be bringing down the city's overall tax revenue from commercial properties. Um, I can, the uh, the vacancies on these particular properties restaurants, which were brought about by COVID, which are now actually rented out. Okay. Um, and on each one of these properties, the um, vacant, the high vacancy rates are accounted for and they are adjusted in the assessment. Um, once they become rented out, that negative adjustment will be taken away. Wait, they get a discount because they're unrented? For, for high vacancy rates, they do have a discount. They have an adjustment to the, to the value. That seems... So they're already getting break based on their lower actual income. Correct. Okay. Why would we do that? Um, because their argument is that it was vacant for so long, their expenses are higher, um, they were having hard, a hard time renting it out. Um, it is both, both of the properties are now, uh, one is currently rented, the other is almost uh, filled. So the argument is that uh, the fact that they, it wasn't, wasn't been able to be rented out for a long period of time is reflected or, or reflects a lower fair market value. Correct. Is that a city policy or is that how the state requires uh, it's an it? Appraisal, it's an appraisal standard. It's not, has, it's not really, um, the city has nothing to do with it. Huh. Uh, it's just, it's an appraisal practice or an assessment practice, I should say. Mary. So this is a really interesting conversation. I'm curious if, um, if, if there could be a standard that talks about a good faith practice to rent or you know, to some, it, in the future, that there could be a standard for, you know, you're trying to do something and we understand that or the market conditions. I don't know how you would get a, non-subjective way of doing that. But we certainly know of one or two properties. I'm not, don't know if they're this property owners, properties that have sat vacant for years. And it's a little bit hard to imagine that they're vacant because there's no demand as opposed to just a desire to leave them vacant. I mean, I think the policy lever there is a vacancy tax that is tied yeah. to the overall vacancy rate for that particular type of property. And that would take into account what you're talking about. But I'm really curious to hear that the, the assessing already gives folks a break for having a vacant property. That There's several different ways to adjust it. Um, some, of these, some of these properties also have issues with parking, so there can be a, a negative adjustment made for a lack of parking. Um, some of these properties actually did receive assessment because of the lack of parking. And I'm sure some of yours may have that too, I'm not sure, without looking yeah, at it. It's there like are. 26 main, right beside their 28 main. Kind of looking at those two assessments, it didn't feel like what it felt like 28, 30 was really low. Yeah. So if you did that adjustment, I'm not sure how it would be. Yeah. And then, well, 
granted, like looking at 139 Main, which that, that must be the funeral parlor, right? It is. Yeah. That's been sitting vacant for many years. They brought that into their their testimony that because it was vacant, we should lower the valuation. Mm -hmm. They've got a very big um, condition adjustment on that one to make up for it. it it's, that one in particular is not a vacancy adjustment. It's a condition adjustment because it's not. I mean, it's down to the studs, even before the flood. I, I haven't been into that building, but I've uh, when Legal Aid was looking at moving from Seven Court Street to where we are now, we looked at that space and people were kind of shaking as they walked away from it. <laughs> it still has the elevator to bring the caskets up to the first floor. Right. Well, you see, that's a plus. But <laughs> the laboratory in the basement. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, if there are no other questions, the chair would entertain a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? And Kim, you're recusing yourself from this one. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That is the last assessment appeal. And at this point, I believe I can say we are adjourned. <laughs>